yet another threat modeling talk today. So what do you mean threat model every story? Also known as go away and take your threat model with you who has that kind of time, what do you think we do here and who let this guy in? <laughs> True words, I've heard this one. I wasn't supposed to, but I did. <laughs> so let's start with the beginning, who, who am I? Uh, my name is Cesar. I'm the current lead product security architect for Autodesk. Autodesk, many of you probably already heard about it. A uh, company with uh, 250 plus products, most of them in the area of making things. Our, our motto is uh, make anything. And uh, we go from computer aided, uh, aided design to uh, 3D printing and uh, special effects. Things that before I joined I had no clue that Autodesk uh, worked with. Then uh, I also participate as uh, uh, part of the Technical Leadership Council of SafeCode. A lot of people are not uh, familiar with SafeCode. It's a consortium of companies like uh, Microsoft, Siemens, uh, Symantec, AutoCAD, um, Security Innovation, I believe. That there's between 10 and 15 different uh, companies. And we generate a lot of uh, content for uh, training, uh, white papers, everything around uh, pushing forward uh, secure coding standards and, uh, as I said, training. And the uh, wall of te text repeat offender, unfortunately, I'm one of those people that puts a lot of texts in there. I promise to try not to read it, but I, I put a lot of text. Now, a uh, funny thing happened on the way to AppSec GlobalSec. Uh, I was on the plane, and for some reason I went over my email, and I looked at the email for the speakers, and then I noticed the last line, and it said, you have 30 minutes to present. At that moment, I had to go through a Thanos uh, process, and click my fingers and half of my slides disappeared because I was ready for much more. So, um, also with that my spiel gets, gets changed and I had very little time to adapt, so at times I'm going to like stop and go and look at the slides and see where, where I'm supposed to be, but uh, hopefully everything will make sense at the end. At the end of these 30 minutes, um, you are going to know about the methodology that we are using at uh, Autodesk now to do threat modeling. Keep in mind, as I said, we have 250 plus products. We have uh, a somewhat large uh, product security team, but security at all team. But uh, the people focusing on threat modeling uh, are a very limited number. And uh, hopefully you can start already thinking, if that interests you, how you can use it in your own environment. And if we have the time, I can promise, I would like to show you guys uh, a threat modeling tool that we have been working on. It's called PyTM that actually tries to implement threat modeling as code. This is the uh, working definition that we have today for threat modeling. And the important parts here is to say that it's a conceptual exercise. And why is that important? Because conceptual means you have to think about what you're doing. Uh, what I mean is my belief is that there will be never a tool that will be able to do threat modeling in such a way that people will say, I got my model, it's in there, I pressed the button, I got a report, that's my threat model. I, I just don't see it happening. Uh, at the end of the day, what you get is an understanding of how you have to move the characteristics of your system from where it is right now to a place where it is more secure than it was before. You want to minimize the risk for the owners, for the users, and for the operators. Or it can be seen as throwing bad stuff at a system and seeing what happens. That's much, more, much simpler than the other definition, but it's basically the same thing. So at the end of the day, what we want from threat modeling, you want this thing called findings. You want to figure out stuff about your system that you didn't know before, and then you want to uh, take those things and make them better. There are many methodologies to do that. There were some examples in a, in a very nice uh, uh, talk that we had like two talks ago, so I won't go over them. But my understanding is that the best, the best methodology for you is the one that gives you findings with the least expenditure of energy. So you're going to put as little input into it and still get findings. And why, again, that is, is that important? Because it is known to be a somewhat heavy process. And uh, there are many, many variables into it 
but if you can keep doing it, as we're going to see, you keep getting results out of it. So if you manage to find a methodology that works in your environment and that gives you findings that are uh, of an acceptable quality, you probably found the thing that works for you. Okay, so at Autodesk, we were looking for a methodology that, oh wait, no, I jumped to one. Yeah, so in the beginning, before I got to Autodesk, uh, I've been there for about a year and a half there now, and we had these three problems. We were seeing threat modeling as a release gate. Instead of something that happened at design time, it was something that was happening closer to release. So people would say, oh, you can't release if you don't have a threat model. Quick, 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 somebody makes, uh, make a threat model. Then we had a throw over the wall problem. People would develop something, and then take that something, give to somebody who's not part of the development, uh, development team, and expect to receive a threat model back. And we had the threat model once file away forever problem. Because it was a gate, they would generate a threat model, and those findings would not really be addressed as something that had to be fixed. If they were, then it would be, oh, okay, put it on the queue, and eventually we're going to get to there. The criticality and the severity of the findings was not exactly uh, addressed. So we started looking for a, method a methodology that would uh, answer to a number of uh, parameters. We needed something that was accessible. We wanted something that a product team could do by themselves after some minimal uh, uh, period of uh, instruction. And that they could keep doing by themselves. We wanted something that was... What? Something that was scalable. So we wanted something that could have could be done by a lot of teams uh, over many uh, interactions and that they could be doing in, in a short time. We wanted something that was educational. We wanted to remove the fact that it was throw over the wall and actually the team would uh, learn something every time that uh, they would do it. And the findings would have a value of teaching the team something. Instead of telling them, ha ha ha, you did something wrong again, go fix it we would actually be teaching them, uh, this is how you actually should look at it, this is how you should be doing it. We wanted something that was useful. There is no point in saying I have uh, 300 findings when 298 of them are actually false positives. We wanted something that answered to the parameters of uh, agility. It uh, wouldn't slow down the team. The team would be able to incorporate that into their processes and it wouldn't stop them from doing the thing that they are actually supposed to do, which is create a product. We wanted it to be representative. At the end of the process, we wanted to be, look, uh, to be able to look at the model and say, yes, this actually represents the system that we want to model. And we wanted it to be unconstrained, meaning it was open so that people would be uh, able to, to go beyond whatever was in front of them and say, okay, we spent some time in this, we worked on these basic uh, uh, issues, now let's go and imagine what else could possibly go wrong. And that's how we got to the case for continuous threat modeling. So we were very fortunate that we have people like uh, Jim, that I guess most of you are familiar with, uh, with the name, to come and put forward something that basically everybody feels. Right now, every software developer is a security engineer, if you want it or if you don't. Because we are taking that code, we are putting it everywhere, we are putting it right in front of the customer, and that means that you are putting it right in front of the attacker as well. Once you do that, then your responsibility to your um, software developers becomes one that, uh, again, you, you don't want to correct them, you want to help them to do the right thing. On top of that, uh, if the code is now the security of the organization you work for, you want to consider that uh, uh, minimal threshold. The moment that you start having problems in that code, that, that is the biggest problem that you have to deal with. One of the things that uh, uh, started appearing were user stories that developers would work on, and they would define them as non-security user stories. Meaning, I got the story, I have to develop that, and you know what, it, it doesn't have any security uh, value. It, it's not something that I have to deal with security. When, uh, when I look at it. And this is going to be a, a somewhat naive example, but it's actually a true one. It, it came from a real case with some adaptations, but it happened. So as a manager, uh, managed server, I want to be able to report to the central server my uptime and a heartbeat status. 
So I want to be able to send every X time I send a packet, get a heartbeat, and I know how, how long that server has been up. Now, that's how you get a server written in C, running as root, that nobody has any clue how it was written and what's happening in there. Why? Because when the developer was working on that simple story that apparently had no security value, he had a number of decisions to make, not only in terms of implementation, but also in terms of design. He was not only a, a, a software developer as a security uh, uh, engineer, he was also an architect. So they had the opportunity of changing the, the, the basic design of the system by making a number of decisions, and that wasn't taken into consideration. And that's how we came up with what we call the threat model every story methodology. So it begins very simply. Build a baseline. Get the, the system that you have right now. If you're just starting, so much the better. But uh, we all know that it's very rare at the time that you can threat model right at the inception of a system. Sometimes you have to jump into a, a, a car that's already moving fast. So uh, start by building a baseline. We use whatever methodology you want, don't care. Just come up with something that represents the system that you have right now and that lets us take a look at uh, the state of the security of it right now. Find somebody who's going to be a threat model curator. Now, it's important to point out that this person, he's not the owner of the threat model, he's not responsible for the threat model, he is responsible for keeping the threat model up to date. So he's basically the person who's going to somehow, we haven't decided yet, going to talk to other people and say, hey, do you have something for me that I should put into the, the, the threat model? Okay. Now, every time that your developers pull a story out of the backlog, then we tell them to make a, a small decision. If the story has no security value, move forward. If the story does have some security value, and by that I mean if the story generates a, not, a security notable event, something that actually touches security in some way, then we want them to open a ticket. That ticket gets addressed to the curator, and that person is going to decide if that ticket is going into the threat model, or if it's going to become another ticket for the documentation people, or for the deployment people, or for QA, or anything of that sort. And then, you just make sure that your curators are on top of the findings, so they have this incoming queue. You want them to be able to process that queue at the velocity of your system, so that that's as empty as possible. Now, if you guys noticed, I jumped something very uh, obvious in there. I spoke about those security notable events. But just on the slide before that, I complained that the developer got the, uh, uh, the story and he wasn't able to make a decision if there was a security issue in there or not, right? So here's where we had to figure a way to give them the, that knowledge as quick as possible and in a way that was as actionable as possible. And that's when we found Dr. Richard Feynman, the famous physici uh, physicist. Perhaps many of you are familiar with him. And he used to say, teach principles and not formulas. Now, in our context here, what would be a principle, what, what would be a formula? To come to a developer once a year and drop on them 12 hours of CBT, and in that CBT tell them how to deal with SQL injection by explaining to them, well, on Java, if you're writing a, a SQL query, this is how you write a proper query, you're teaching them a formula. If tomorrow that guy goes and starts developing in Python, he's going to figure out what the formula for Python is. If tomorrow is, I don't know, Perl, then they're going to have to figure out how to do that in Perl. You're teaching formulas, you're teaching something that they have to apply every single time on you. On the other hand, if you explain to them what an SQL injection is and why are there these formulas and what's common between them, then you're basically teaching a principle. Tomorrow this guy's going to work on, I don't know, whatever new language of the, the hour comes up, 
he's going to be able to figure out by himself because he understands the principle, he understands the problem underlying the whole thing. And that's how we came, with, uh, we came up with these two things. Uh, one of them is the handbook, and it has a list of subject areas. And the other one is a checklist. There's a, a, a slight but important difference between both of them. We're going to see them uh, soon. But the important thing is that the handbook is used to build that baseline. So you question, and you then continue questioning during the official design time. And it's in quotes, why? Because we know sometimes you don't have the official design time. You just have the system running, and you jumped in and you said, let's do a threat model right now. So that becomes the, uh, the official design time, or when building a ba uh, baseline. And then you have the checklist that you give to the developers, and that checklist is going to verify that the principles are being followed during implementation. So we have one document that's used at the baseline and explaining how to do the whole process, and one that's used, used by the developers whenever they are actually implementing things. So the handbook looks like this. These are the, um, the titles of the main areas. This is a, a wiki page, of course, so if you click on each one of them, it's going to open up and um, uh, show more about it. And I think that the important part here is in the performing the threat model, which is the time when we jump in with the subject areas. This is just the beginning of the subject areas. I think that right now we have something like 12 different subject areas. And the interesting thing here is that um, we give you the subject, but those bullets in there, they are just simple questions. They are not a checklist. We are not expecting people to answer yes, no, yes, no, don't understand the question, yes, no, no. That, that's not the, the result here. What we want is to use those questions to start generating a conversation at the time that they go and examine each one of these areas, and they start saying, okay, what do they want to know about trust boundaries? So we want to start something like, can you identify the, the levels of trust that you have in your system? And that's going to generate the question of, okay, what's, what's a trust change? What, uh, what is this trust boundary thing? And that's going to happen once, going to happen twice. And because you have the whole team in there, we expect the, the dialogue to end up being an educational thing. We don't say you have to have a security matter expert in the room at the time that this is happening. But you have one that you can turn to. We have uh, Slack channels, we have email, we have a list of people that they know that they can go to. We have security champions in each, uh, each product. So there's always somebody that they can run to and ask. If they ask to have a security matter expert in the room, we try to accommodate that as much as we can. But again, that's not something that happens in every, every single uh, iteration. That's something that happens when you're building this baseline. On the other hand, the checklist, this is what's called the traditional checklist. This is the checklist for the space shuttle uh, landing procedure. That's how it starts. <laughs> And basically what we see here is that it's a, a, a do-check list. It goes over time and it says, when you get to this time, you're supposed to turn these switches to this position, and if you don't, bad things are going to happen. So basically the pilot is supposed to follow the list, and as they go with the list, they change the switches. The format that we chose for our checklist is a bit different. It's a if, then, if this, then that format. And in that, uh, in that format, the important part is the if this format is written in common language. We don't have anything on the black side here that is remotely uh, security-oriented. A developer is able to look at this and say, this is something that I did, or this is something that I am about to do. And they don't have to have any prior knowledge of security. Once they get to there, then they don't, uh, go to the other side, and when they open up the, uh, the items, instead of getting a book or a wall of text or anything like that, you get one paragraph saying, this is sort of what we want from you, and this is where you can get more information about it. Why are we so interested in keeping things small? Because at the end of the day, what we want is for this checklist to disappear. Think about when you learn 
uh, a sport, okay, or, or anything that requires a, a skill. Basically, somebody shows you how to do something, then you spend hours upon hours trying it, and then you build muscle memory. Once you have muscle memory, then you don't have to think about it, you just go forward and you play. The thing is that we don't have the thousands of, of hours that are needed to build this kind of muscle memory. So we had to find a way to give people something, to take them by, by the hand, to make sure that they know that they are going through the right motions. But at the end of the day, a developer looks at it and says, hey, this is just like using a library, it's just like calling an API. He's just asking me to do a number of steps every time that I do something specific. So when they reach that point, you can say that they have the muscle memory to just get the checklist, throw it away, and move forward. Now, this series of um, diagrams, <laughs> I'll ask you guys one thing, I'm, I'm really bad at drawing diagrams. So, as they change, forget the sizes. The, the sizes, they, they have no connection between one frame and the other. But what I'm trying to show here is that over time, there is some effort involved in the work of uh, making, creating a, a threat model. In the idealized way of doing a threat model, you have a design before you even start implementing. You do this effort called creating a threat model. You identify all the controls that you have to put in there. You make all the changes to the design that you have to make. And then you just develop, and at the end of the day, you have a secure product. When we go into real life and we look at it, we see that, yes, we have effort in the beginning. Then you have development. During development, things happen. Things change. And when you get to the end, probably the system that you developed in the beginning is not the same one that you have. So you have to, again, invest all the effort in the same thing just to get a threat model that's up to date. Of course, that sounds very uh, waterfall-y, because you have the design in the beginning, then you, you move into implementation. When you go into Agile, this is the expected thing. Every so, ever so often, you get to a spike in between your sprints, and you say, okay, let's threat model what I have up to here, and that keeps you up to date until the end when you have a threat model that corresponds to the, the system as it is. The problem is that when you observe what's happening in the real world, you get to this. Yes, you put the effort into each one of the, uh, of the sprints, but then at the end you have to go back and touch all those things that you missed. Because in each one of these uh, spikes in the sprints, they are limited themselves. So if you are putting time into your threat model and all of a sudden you run out of time, hey, move on, you have to develop, right? So you end up with a threat model that doesn't, still doesn't uh, correspond to what you actually did. Now, continuous threat modeling, our expectation is that in the beginning, you're going to spend some time doing that baseline, and then you're going to spend, each, each uh, developer is going to spend some time in the checklist, and then some time doing work. So the checklist is the purple thing, and the blue is actual work. So to be checklist work, checklist work, checklist work, and at the end of the thing, there's nothing to be done. Because since the thing was continuously updated as each story changed the system, you actually move together with the changes. So the threat model that you end up having is one that actually expre expresses the, uh, the system as it is. What we have observed happens, and we have been uh, working with this methodology for about a year now, is that you start with the baseline, of course, and then you have work, and the developer consults the checklist. They go back to the checklist and they say, did I do anything that is in this checklist? And then they do that, that again and again and again and again. And when they get to the purple part, that's when the checklist became part of the work. Instead of now checking it before or after, they're actually doing it as they do the work. Because now they know what we want from them. Now, of course, this is not a silver bullet, this is not uh, uh, perfect, there are problems. The first one that we have is that, remember that uh, the subject area, I said that the bullets, they are not a checklist. Sometimes, and it, it's totally a cultural thing, we can't convince teams that the subject list is not a checklist. So at the end of the, the baseline, 
uh, we, re we receive for review a list of yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, true, false. Because they actually go to each bullet and just answer yes or no to the bullet. So it's very hard to get people to step out of the thing that I gave you a list, yes, but that's not the whole list. This is just a conversation starter to get you doing the, the right thing. By definition, this methodology is evolutionary. We are not expecting to get the best thing at the end of the process. We want today's threat model to be better than yesterday's, and tomorrow's to be better than today's. So, yes, you are going to have findings that you are not going to uh, identify right away, but they're going to move forward, and your team is going to learn from it and get better at it. You still need uh, a security group or a security expert to uh, educate the team. They're not going to learn by themselves. And somebody has to identify those areas that need more focus for each one of the teams. And, oh, sorry. It's really... Uh, oh. Okay, so it's really dependent on the quality of the input. Garbage in, garbage out. If you don't put enough input in there, you're going to get bad stuff. Here, we had a, a very interesting case. Um, we had a group, a product team, that knew that we request a threat model, but they did not know that we, have, that we had the methodology. So they went forward and they did their threat model using one of the tools that are available today. Uh, they came up with 355, uh, 357 findings. 264 of them were non-starters because they did some mistake in the annotations or they forgot some field or something. And the tool just spewed findings based on what's, what was missing. 33 of them were non-applicable. Non they answered something that uh, <laughs> the question did not, did not apply to the system, but still they appeared as findings. Seven of them actually needed investigation. Seven of them sounded like something that was useful. 53 of them were mitigated. Why mitigated? Because it turns out that they generated the report once, they figured out there was one more attribute that they could change from true to false or something like that, and suddenly 53 uh, of them were mitigated, notwithstanding if they had that value or not in the system. And most of the time they spent work, uh, most of the work they, sp they spent was identifying false positives. So they came up with that and said, hey, here's our threat model, review it, and let's be done with it. And we said, wait, we have this methodology, do you mind redoing it? We're using the methodology. So they actually were very nice and they did it. And after a short time, and I think the two rounds of review, they came up with 13 high value findings. All of them were mitigated. All of them are not present in the product uh, as it gets released. And most of the work was identifying system-specific true positives. They were actually spending time going through the subject areas and looking for things that apply to their system and actually getting, getting them to appear as findings. So, um, in the future, when people ask you, where were you when Autodesk released the methodology, you can say that you were there. <laughs> So today we are releasing it under a, a CC uh, Creative Commons license. It's on GitHub. Oh, sorry. And uh, it's there for you guys. If you see some use in it, please do use, let us know. And uh, if you have any review, we would love getting some, anything that you guys find in there that you think that should be changed or should be added or that you don't agree with. We are really looking forward for some discussion. Okay, some more uh, references, something from uh, Safe Code that uh, came, I think, a year ago with a, different of, uh, a bunch of different methodologies where you can compare stuff. The IEEE um, Center for Secure Design, that's uh, sort of the top 10 problems that you would find in a threat model. And the OWASP threat model in Slack channel, I, I can't... I, I can't say good things enough. There's like a bunch of really smart people in there that just hang around and talk threat modeling. Now, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time for that. That's the tool that I uh, mentioned. If uh, anybody feels like having a demo, catch me outside. I'll be happy to show you what we have there. It's a tool that, again, <laughs> it goes against what I said in the beginning. 
there's not going to be a tool that's going to, uh, to solve all your problems. But this one, even though it does find, it does find some uh, uh, useful stuff, it is more targeted towards helping the team spend more time talking than doing. So you are able to use Python code to actually create the model of your system and incorporate that into your threat modeling independent of whatever methodology you're using. But uh, since developers know code and you tell them now describe your system with code, it becomes something much more natural for them than using a, a GUI where they have to start moving symbols around and connecting things. And it, uh, it's Visio, but I have a Linux machine and now I have a VM and this. Blah, blah, blah. So this actually gives them something that they can work with uh, off the, the bat. Any questions? I hope I managed to keep a line that was some, somehow logical. No? Okay. Thank you.